Hey everybody, Dr. O here. Let's cover the special senses. So I promise this is going to be a little bit of a shorter review than I usually do. This topic, not saying it's not important, but uh, it's definitely not as important as the amount of time we're putting into things like the brain. So, and some of these questions are a little easier to answer quickly, which is hard for me to do. You, you know that. Which two special senses can only respond to chemicals once they've been dissolved? So they're chemoreceptors. They, the chemicals have to be dissolved in a liquid like saliva or mucus before they can actually transmit a signal. That is smell and taste. Or if you want, to, you want to get fancy, that would be olfaction for smell or gustation for taste. What are your four primary taste sensations and then what are the other two? So the primary ones you've probably all heard of, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. And they are all over the place. Like I know you see these maps where you see this sensations here, this sensations here. There, There's more of them in some areas. Like there's a lot more bitter receptors in the back of the tongue, but they're really everywhere. So sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. And the other two are, they're actually your water receptors. They're primarily in your pharynx. And umami is the one we talk about a lot now. So umami seems to sense um, proteins, amino acids, just like sweet senses sugar and things like sugar um, and salt. Um, sense of salt. The umami one, like if you really want to trigger it, Parmesan cheese, like broth, these are the kind of things that really seem to trigger this umami sensation. So culinary people talk about this a lot more. So, so those are your four primary tastes, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter, and the two extra ones, water and umami. I do want to mention one thing, bitter. There's more bitter receptors than any, any, anything else. I think it just has to do with a survival standpoint. Like sweet and salty tell us what we like and we want to eat. Bitter tells you what to avoid primarily. So if something's bitter, like now you can make things that are bitter now pretty easily. But in nature, most things that are bitter are either poisonous or have turned, have gone bad. So it was a pretty good warning to be cautious about a food, which is why I think there's so many, so many bitter receptors. Kind of like why there's there's more cold receptors than warm receptors because getting too cold can kill you and be dangerous much more quickly than getting too warm. All right, um, know the key anatomical features of the eye. Obviously, the video where I show you the eye is going to work better here. But uh, uh, so we have cornea, lens, sclera, conjunctiva, iris, pupil, retina, and optic disc. So the cornea is going to be, the cornea and the sclera are the same thing. They're the outside of the eye, the tough outermost fibrous piece of the eye. The difference is the sclera is white because you don't have to see through it. The cornea is transparent. So the cornea is the transparent outer portion of the eye. You're going to hear the word transparent a lot because everything that's between the world and my retina has to be transparent or I can't see it. So the cornea is the transparent outer portion of the eye. The lens, the lens is actually what bends what we see and refracts it to direct it to the retina. So the lens is what allows us to see with focus. The sclera, the white of your eye, so it's the tough outer portion but doesn't have to be clear because you're not looking through it. The conjunctiva, the conjunctiva is the thin um, epithelial layer that's on the surface of the eye and in your eye eyelids. So it's just, uh, it reduces friction, these types of things. Uh, you, you've all heard of conjunctivitis, they call it pink eye. So conjunctivitis would be an inflammatory condition of the conjunctiva. It can happen because of pathogens, it can happen because of trauma, lots of things can cause it. All right, so the iris. The iris and the pupil are related. The pupil isn't a thing. The pupil is an opening. The iris is the colored portion of your eye that determines how big the opening is, and, that, and that's determined by light. So if you turn the lights off, the pupil gets the iris gets bigger, making the pupil get bigger, and vice versa. So the iris is the colored portion of your eye that does change shape to allow more or less light in. The pupil is the opening. Okay, the retina. Retina is the back of the eye where all your photoreceptors are, your rods and cones. There are other receptors too, like the retinal ganglion cells being the key one. They tell your brain if you're being exposed to light or not. You don't see that, but what it's, it's, it's specifically looking for blue light. So it tells you, is the sun up or not? But of course, now it's artificial. I have two huge lights blasting on me right now. It doesn't matter what time it is. So that's the, the Irish pupil retina. So the retina is going to be where we actually see. And the optic disc is your blind spot. There's one part of the back of the eye that doesn't have any retinal cells, and that's this optic disc or blind spot. That's because that's where the optic nerve is exiting the eye, and it's also where your blood vessels enter. So the optic disc creates a blind spot in one eye. Now, we don't really have one because we have two eyes, and our blind spots don't, they don't overlap. Okay, what are the key differences between your rods and your cones? So I'll just compare and contrast them. Rods see, see black and white, um, shades of gray. Cones see in color. Rods um, don't see clear defined edges. So they, so they, they don't see things in full color. They, they see things kind of blurry. 
so you, this is all bad, right? So far, the con, the cones are for central vision. They see color. They see great detail. They see fine edges. So rods think peripheral vision, but it's poor vision. Cones, central vision, clear vision, color vision, right? We can see a million colors or more. So what are rods for? Rods don't need a lot of light. So the advantage of rods, the reason we have so many of them in our periphery is they help us see in the dark. When, it, when prey might be stalking us or, or, or something like that. So cones need lots of light. You have to be looking right at something to use them. So they're, they're much better. So if you want to look at something, what do you do? Turn the lights on and look right at it. That makes a world of sense. But the rods are there to protect us in low light environments. So you might see movement. You might be able to notice something moving. You have no idea what it is. That's kind of the role of the rods. All right. What vitamin plays a critical role in vision? What is a common condition associated with the deficiency of this vitamin? So the role in vision is vitamin A. We need vitamin A to see. Our retinal cells can't transmit their signals without it. What is a common condition? That's going to be night blindness. So if you can see during the day when there's tons of light, so your, your cells can't actually transmit signals very well, but there's more than enough light around. You go in a low light environment, you actually can now see you have this problem. So if you have night blindness, you have problems during the day too, but there's plenty of light to go around. <clears throat> okay, what's the cause of the blind spot in our eye? We just mentioned that it's the optic disc. There's no, there's, there, it doesn't overlap though, so I don't have any blind spots in my vision here. But if I close one eye, there is a blind spot. What does 2020 vision mean, and how about 2040? And we'll do a few other numbers here. So 2020 vision, what we call perfect vision, means that if someone with that level of vision was it was 20 feet away from something I could see it, then you would be 20 feet away from it to see it. So um, 2040 vision, so less than quote unquote perfect vision, would mean that if somebody with perfect vision could see something from 40 feet away, you'd have to be 20 feet away. So you don't have as good a vision as them. I have 2800 vision without, without correction. So legally blind would be 2200 um, with correction. Um, so I, you know, without my contacts or my glasses, I'm way beyond legally blind. So 2,800, that means if you have 20-20 vision, you could be 800 feet away from something and see it. I'd have to be 20 feet away from it to see it. Now, we do have better than perfect vision, though. So about 2015 or 2010. So somebody has 2010 vision. That means if you had perfect 2020 vision, you'd need to be 10 feet away from something to see it as well as they see it as 20. So do remember that. We call 2020 perfect vision, but there is better than perfect. A lot of your high-level athletes have really, really good vision. I've noticed working with baseball players especially, many, many, many baseball players have better than perfect vision. So that's what those numbers mean, 2020, 2040, 2200, whatever. All right, what are the colors of your three cones? So they're not your primary colors. They're blue, green, and red. So everything we see is a combination of blue cones being stimulated, green cones, and red cones being stimulated. So um, some people do have more sensitive cones, and they can see exponential more colors than the average person. But that, that allows you to see a million or more colors real easily, those three cones. All right. <clears throat> What is the function of your auditory ossicles? So maybe you've never heard the term auditory ossicle, but you've heard of these. Um, the malleus, incus, and stapes, your ear bones, your middle ear bones. Um, when you were younger, they probably called them the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. So at least they did when I was younger. So they, they actually take, so when sound enters the ears and strikes your tympanic membrane or your eardrum, it actually, it, it, it amplifies that vibration. So that a tiny bit of pressure on the eardrum leads to a loud sound. So it allows us to hear things that are very quiet. Now on the flip side, we have muscles like the stapedius muscle that can clamp down on these to minimize their vibration. That way, if there's a really loud sound, we don't send too much of a signal through them um, so we don't hear things too loud. Now, that's why the most dangerous loud sounds are the ones you don't know are coming. You're startled by them. If you know it's going to be loud, it's almost like your, these muscles can brace. So that's the function of the auditory ossicles is actually to transmit sound from the eardrum to the cochlea where we hear. All right, what is the function of the saccule and the utricle of the vestibule? Say that three times fast. I'm not even going to try that. So I'll try it. What the heck? Saccule, utricle, vestibule, saccule, utricle, vestibule, saccule, utricle, vestibule. All right. So, um, <clears throat> So as a group, their job is to is to constantly remind your body and your head uh, the position and acceleration of your inner ear and of your head. So the saccule specifically is looking at horizontal movement. The utricle is looking at vertical movement. So as you as you're moving, 
um, moving through space, walking or whatever, um, or you're, you're, you're moving horizontally or vertically, the saccule and utricle are both sending signals to your brain to tell you where you are in space. And that connects to the next, the semicircular canals, their function is rotational movement. So if you're rotating, obviously if I'm bending and twisting and rotating, all these things are going to be involved. The saccule, the utricle, and the semicircular canals are going to be telling my, my body where my head is in space. So semicircular canals, just think rotational movement. Cochlea is hearing. So cochlea is actually where we hear. Um, the, the location in the, the cochlea is this cool nautilus looking shape. The location, the part of the cochlea that's stimulated tells you the tone or pitch of what you're hearing, the frequency of what you're hearing. How much of that section of the cochlea is stimulated tells you how loud it is, which brings us to the last point. How is sound energy measured? It's measured in decibels. So you probably heard that term. I wrote a few down. Um, a whisper is 30 decibels. A lawnmower is 90 a uh, concert, like a not a super loud concert, but a pretty loud concert would be 120. And a jet engine, a jet plane flying close by would be 140. So the la those last two could easily cause some some hearing, hearing loss, hearing damage over time, especially. So, okay. So those are your special senses. Have a wonderful day. Be blessed.